Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for uh, joining today. My name is Krista Baca, and this is Greg Baca. Hey. And we are really excited about what we're going to be talking about today. Um, we're going to be talking about healthy families. And Greg and I are really passionate about this subject. It's something that we are just extremely passionate about. Um, we have been married for now 17 years. We just celebrated Crazy. 17 years in May, and we have two kiddos, one 10 year old and one five year old, both as you know, those of you with kids know, as different as they could possibly be. We have one who is like completely introverted and like a little scientist, always dreaming up new little <laughs> creations. And then we have one who's the most extroverted person that you've ever met, always designing new fashion things and just she's just a, our little wild child. yes she'll introduce herself at five yes. and tell people that she is an artist yes and not too long ago was it her grandpa oh uh, yeah said yeah well you you can be an artist when you get big and she said no i am an artist yes. so <laughs> that is our luciana yes five going on 25 and um just to give you a little background about about who we are and what we've what we've kind of used used our life spent our life on um we are the founders of go international you can find it online at gointernational.tv and um what we have done for many years is short-term missions and in these past few years we have moved into church planting as well as uh, in 2012 we set we kind of closed all of our doors here in the United States and moved overseas to the nation of Ecuador, where we lived for four years and planted a mission space there. And so kids in the midst of those kinds of things, uh, we have decided that they would be part of that journey, that the kids were not something that was like ministries on over here in one compartment and kids are in another. We felt very much that, um, and as people are logging in, I'll just make a little note. If you can mute your microphones, um, that makes it a little bit easier for everybody who's tuning in. And at the very end, we will um, have a little time for Q&A. So, but we felt that kids were not kind of an afterthought of our life and ministry, but kids were part of the calling of the ministry that we put it in our hearts that as we're doing ministry together, that we, would intricately involve our kids in the work of the ministry. Myself, I grew up in a pastor's home when I was seven years old. My parents started their church and I never looked at it as something that my parents did. I literally felt like I was one of the founding members of the church. Like when my parents got the call from the Lord to be in ministry that same day, my brothers and I actually set up uh, a little place in the in the basement of our home and set it up as like podiums and and a speaker and said mom and dad you guys this is what's going to make you happy is and this is what you should do with your life and so i felt like on that day like we also were called into the ministry and my parents very much intricately involved us in everything that they were doing and so that's how we've chosen to live our life yeah and i think it's interesting as we as we share a little bit today both chris and i we have different uh backgrounds even growing up as, as kids as she said she was raised in a minister's home uh, I was not and so it's interesting as we raise our own kids trying to define what are the attributes that are unique to being raised in a minister's home versus what's just part of childhood and having parents that that work and so we'll, we'll share a little bit of those uh, things today as we go but we kind of just wanted you to know a little bit of our background you know uh, with Go International we would when we first started, uh, which was 2003, we took teams of people all over the world on short-term trips. And we did that for nine years before moving and starting a, a base down in Ecuador. And when we, when we did make that move, Zion, uh, our oldest son, he was only two years old at the time. And so it was very much a family decision. You know, I think maybe it caused us to just kind of weigh the ramifications of life in ministry with our family on another level than what we had already done. You know, I mean, it's one thing to work in ministry in the U S and it's another to remove them from their home language and culture and, 
all that's normal to them. And it was very much apparent that like, okay, that, that's a family lifestyle. And so Zion, like I said, he was two when we moved. And then Luciana was actually born in Ecuador in 2015. So we're really sharing from the perspective today, uh, the thought of what does it look like to have healthy families um, in, and also healthy ministry. It's not one or the other. Like I don't buy into the thought that you have to, to choose. Um, I think that God graces us to do all that he's placed in front of us and that he has equipped us and called us to be good stewards of, of, uh, of the things he's entrusted us with. And so we're going to kind of share like today, like very practically, um, you know, when we're talking about healthy family, there's a lot of things that we can, a, a lot of things that we can say that all of us agree to. Uh, and for those of you who are, who are in ministry, and have you know had your families or you have your families now it's it's one of those things where there's a lot of times where we know the the thing that we should do like we could all probably quote the scriptures and we all know that like okay family is important and it's important to prioritize uh at the same time i think we all are cognizant of the fact that it's different to mentally know what we should be doing versus like how do we actually pragmatically implement it in our daily and weekly lives. So if you'll allow us today, we're going to just be super practical. Uh, that tends to be a little bit of our uh, style as we really feel like uh, spirituality and, and God working in us in the earth, it, it ultimately does come down to pretty practical things day in and day out of being faithful with what's been put in front of us. So we're going to share today some thoughts that we've adopted and then we'd like to, to pass on to you all. And also, uh, let me say this as well. We have a 10-year-old and a five-year-old, as I mentioned. We are not coming to you from, hey, we've, you know, we are experts in this and we have it nailed down. Like, listen to all that we say. I know that we can all learn from each other. We just want to share kind of what we've adopted as our own family that, uh, that is kind of a sweet spot or that tends to work for us. And hopefully that as we share... Um, there'll be some things that you can take away in your own lives as well. So really, we want to, to share some of the some practical thoughts today. And the first thing that I would say is recognize that like the, the challenge with, with I, I think maybe all parents have a little bit of the tension of, okay, work versus family. And okay, I've, I've got to work in order to support my family. So there's normal tension that's there. But there's also something unique to those of us who are ministers that I think we all recognize, which is the tension is it's, it's on one hand, ministry and things and it's people, you know, ultimately ministry is just another word of saying helping people and have, and we're often forced or it feels like we're forced to choose like, okay, do I choose to help people? And then let my family kind of, you know, not receive maybe the attention they should, or do I focus on my family and then disappoint others? It, it sometimes can feel like on either side of that coin, somebody is disappointed. And so I, I think, first off, I, I do, we empathize with that thought, but I don't think we have to live by that thought. I don't think that, I think we can frame a different reality where we don't have to live with guilt either way, but where we can almost, what we've, what we've attempted to do as our family is to make decisions beforehand. So we kind of live by some principles and some filters that help us to make quality decisions when the tensions rise, when it's like, oh, should we do this or should we do that? We kind of already established a, uh, a, a decision-making filter that helps us in how we navigate life in ministry. So one of the first uh, thoughts that we would share with all of you is it's very important to create a family culture. You know, um, I'm, both of us are very big in the thought of creating culture. And, and what I mean by culture is, it, it, culture is a way in which you do things. What's your sense of normal? Um, I think about even just going, when we went to Panama and mm -hmm. we went to these remote tribes to bring fresh water to the people that were there. And it was like totally wild to us because 
what happened was on the way to Panama to go bring fresh water to these people, I found out that I was pregnant with Zion. And I just remember starting to think about like the implications of like, wow, will I ever even be able to do these kinds of trips? And what is it going to be like to be a mom in ministry and all those kinds of things? And then contrasting that against this culture, the Kuna culture, where literally it's so remote. There's, it's off the coast of Panama, 365 islands, and it's so remote that they don't even have wheels there like they get every they get everywhere in dugout canoes they go from island to island and we saw this other culture that existed this other normal that existed and it really like god really spoke to us through that that normal is really relative you know we saw these little little guys jumping off the piers with a little uh spear in their hands like two years old swimming like amazing swimmers and they would spear a fish jump out of the water and go bring it back to their homes because that was their normal that was their reality and it was in that moment that we started thinking like really normal is whatever you create it to be yeah you're you're kind of handed or born into a, a normal or a culture and i think you know any of you who've traveled internationally you're mindful of that you understand that every country has its own culture and while we, you know, have traveled to many countries, that's one where it was very distinct, where it's like, um, you know, we, we would laugh and say, you know, very often, like they're the, the norm in these islands is instead of beds, they have hammocks, you know, yeah. and there'd be little babies, little ones in hammocks. And there's, a, as an outsider, it almost feels like, oh, whoa, like, why are you putting your baby in a hammock? That's, what if they fall out? And then we laugh and joke and say, if the Kuna came to, uh, the U.S., they might think it was weird that, why are you putting your baby to sleep in a cage, you know, which we call cribs. <laughs> Normal yeah. is, uh, is different based on whatever has been uh, observed or passed down. And, and what that has to do with family culture is you can create, you can have a, a culture by default, which is kind of what we're saying, where it's like maybe it's, we tend to maybe raise our family the way we were raised as kids or even without being intentional, you can end up with a certain culture. But I'm a big believer in creating culture by design, not having a culture by default. And a culture by design starts with thinking of the end in mind. What's important to us? What kind of, uh, what kind of family do we want to have? What are the values that our family has? What are the things that we want to pass on to our children? Um, and being very mindful of that is almost frames our entire conversation today of mm -hmm. thinking about like creating a culture by design and not by default. Uh, Deuteronomy says this, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9 says, The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. The, the thought here being that for us, I think one of the, I think we're all mindful of stereotypes of, you know, pastors, kids or ministers, children. And I don't think we have to buy into that. Uh, like while it might be a stereotype, I think there are things that we can very much do that, um, that make that less likely where it's the kind of rebel ministers kids or whatever. Now, granted, God gives everybody free will and, you know, uh, so uh, this is not prescriptive, but this is the thought of how do we create that culture as a family where, and, and I, I think it's this, I think it's that we need to allow our children to see our faith lived out. I think that's what the scripture is talking about. It's not just a doctrine. It's not just Sunday school. No. It's not just uh, prayers at night or ministry meetings, but it's actually a lifestyle that we live with our kids. That, and so I love when it's talking about just everyday things here. It's saying impress this um, on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, uh, walk along the road when you lie down. So it's kind of like in the everyday life, it should be ingrained with what we're doing. If you'll actually, I don't know if you can, 
Mm -hmm. uh, just a sec. On our back wall here, not that you can read this, but this says the Baca family values. And this is right, uh, we're speaking to you from our home today. Um, and this is at our dinner table. And so we have several different Baca family values. You know, it says we seek to be creative and innovative. We choose to be honest and authentic. We aren't perfect, but we're real. We have all these different values. And these aren't just something we put on the wall. It's actually at our dinner table uh, by, you can scoot back in. <laughs> uh, it's at our dinner table by design. And at night when we have dinner, we'll choose one of these. And we talk about what does that look like? What does it look like? Um, to, and, and we ask them their questions. What does it mean to be um, independent thinkers? You know, we talk about these things. So for us, uh, integrating and creating a culture by design is very much at the forefront of, of I think, having a healthy family. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thought. Uh, I'll let you pick up on the next one. The next thought that we have is, let your family be part of the sacrifices and the victory. The, there's so much that, as you know, there's so much that goes into having a healthy church. There's so much sacrifices that your kids watch. I mean, just being honest, as a, as a pastor's kid, one of the hardest things for me to watch was my parents be so faith. I might cry. My parents be so faithful to so many people. And then to see them or hear, overhear them in the back rooms of the church whispering something negative about my parents. It would, it would just break my heart into a thousand pieces. And I'll never forget one of the, the worst examples of that for me in my life was one day my dad had really gotten to a place in his ministry. He had sat, my mom and dad sacrificed so much and they were just seeing just amazing church growth, explosive growth, but not just like people sitting in the pews. It was like people alive in the church. And then all of a sudden out of nowhere, all these other ministers started kind of rising up against my parents and what they had had set out to do and i remember one day just sitting and turning on the christian radio station and hearing somebody talking about my daddy didn't say his name over the phone but he referred to the the three stooges of the area of the church you can see and i'm like 11 years old and i knew he was talking about my dad because he was saying specific things about our church and he was referring to the the bald the bald stooge and referring to the things that were happening in his church. And I remember my dad's response to that, like set something inside of me, the way that he handled it. Because I think, I think had I been in that situation, I would have been like, how dare he did it. You know what I mean? Like it, that's how I wanted to react. But my dad's reaction was kids, um, shut the radio off and said, kids, why don't you just go back inside for a minute and, he listened to the rest of the, <laughs> he listened to it for the rest of it. He was curious, I think, about what was being said. And then afterwards, he told me, he said, you guys, I don't want you to be angry at that man. He said, he just doesn't know me. He said, because if he knew me, he'd know what you guys know, and he'd know that I'm kind, and he, he just went through his character. And, and he said, I choose to forgive him, and you need to choose to, too. Mm -hmm. and, and he was emotional about it. He said, you know, the things that that man said, it did hurt my feelings. And it was that part of the vulnerability that changed me. Do you know what I mean? Of course, there's the response, you know what I mean? The response of, of walking in love and things like that. But when I saw that it actually hurt him and I saw, oh, he's being really open with me right now. And, and, it, and it earmarked inside of me like a note. The scriptures like became real to me of forgive. And I knew that when I was faced with those moments in my life where I was going to have to choose to forgive, that I was going to take the road that my dad did. And so it's those, it's those kinds of things when we show vulnerability, when we show that, yes, there is sacrifice. And we say, like, you know what, kids, that's, you know, I think of Greg, he's, we started a new church plant here. And for, like, how many months was it? He was up late at night. He'd be working in the I didn't day. know if I was in ministry or if I was a painter. Yes. <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking about. Like you, you were like, mm -hmm. I thought I was going to be called by God into the work of the ministry. And then you're like spray paint, you know, spraying the ceilings of a church or like just doing random stuff that you're like, I did not sign up for this Lord, but I'll do it. I'm your servant. 
And, and our kids would, would say things like, dad, I miss you. You know, dad, you've been working hard. And, and he'd say, he'd respond and say like, I'm just doing this for a season. He would lead them through it and carve out special time for them and sacrifice, not just for the church, but then sacrifice for his, even his own free time to make special time with the kids. And it was like, they know that when they go out there to go do their dreams, they'll know how to sacrifice, yes, but they'll also know that you can't sacrifice your family mm-hmm. in the midst of that. Yeah, and, it, and that's why I, it's not an either or thing. Yeah. I think one of the most important things is to recognize the season. Yeah. That sometimes, mm-hmm. any of us who've been a part of launching something, sometimes there's a season where maybe it's a little more intense yeah. and we can run a little bit harder and faster than what would be sustainable for a lifetime. Mm-hmm. And I think our role is to lead our mm-hmm. families through, through those seasons. So one of the, way, one of the things that I, I would say about uh, sharing in sacrifice and victory is I think that one of the best things that we can do is show a level of sacrifice and show what it takes to be obedient and to do the things that you're called to do or mm-hmm. to birth a dream, whatever language you want to use there. Um, and so for me, you know, I'll, I think of uh, recently, uh, one, of the, one of the things that our church did is we, being a new church plant, we actually uh, launched a uh, coffee shop at, uh, in downtown Tulsa. And it's not, a, it's not branded as a church coffee shop. It's just kind of there as a community coffee shop. Many people have no idea that it even has anything to do with uh, the church but we did it as a means to create connection points with people in the city um, as kind of a, you know, I think at, at our core, Chris and I, we are uh, missionaries, you know, so we are always mindful of reaching out to people that are outside of the walls of the church. And so we wanted to create a place where people who would maybe never step into a church would, uh, would come to a place where we could engage in conversation. So all that to say, um, you know, when, when we had been working on this building and working hard to launch this, the, the, our kids were mindful of the sacrifice and we would share with them and I'd talk to them and they were part of the creating process, which again, we bring them into that. And what I love is we all know the, the, the adage of, you know, many things are caught, not taught. And I think that's very true. It's funny, you know, cause we're so always like blank paper and writing and, you know, planning things out and, the other day, our son was talking about wanting to pitch us an idea. He's like, I just need to write some things down in my Google Docs. So he's talking about his Google document of writing things down so he could present an idea to us. And our daughter, who's five, came the other day and she said, here's the blueprint of my party. And she's showing me, and it had a little disco ball on it. So she's calling her party plan a blueprint. So there's so many things. We never taught them that stuff. They just see it. It's part of our lifestyle of creating and working but uh, all that to say, we had a grand opening for our coffee shop back in uh, March, three days before the lockdown hit. Um, mm-hmm. Not my favorite time of, uh, of opening something, but hey, God's good and we're still navigating through it all. But we have this opening preview night at the coffee shop and we had, uh, you know, 250 people or so show up to this, uh, you know, preview oh. night. And it's a packed house and people are, you know, drinking coffee and having desserts. And it is just feels like life is happening in this place. And we took our kids down there with us and I pulled my son aside. And we stepped to the back and we just looked out across the coffee shop because we renovated an old downtown, like historical building. It's a downtown basement area. And it when you looked like, at it, it looked, it looked like, like a parking, like a parking garage. garage. Yeah. And now it had been renovated and it's just full of art and people and it looks amazing and people are talking but I pull my son aside and I say I want you to look at this I said because this uh this is what it looks like Look, this is what many people recognize as following your dream when it's the success when people are there when you know people want to be a part of it but you have seen what it actually takes mm-hmm. it takes the nights of believing in something and trusting when you know nobody else sees it nobody else understands it you're the only one down there that's painting. And I use it as a teaching moment because I want to, I don't want to shelter him yeah. from sacrifice. I want to show him that, hey, like it's going to require for you to do the things that the Lord has placed in your heart. It's going to require some hard work. It's going to require some faith. Mm-hmm. It's going to require some sacrifice. And if we don't bring them into that process 
And I think, uh, here's what I think the danger is. I think sometimes we allow our kids to experience in the hardship, experience in the sacrifice, but not in the payoff, mm -hmm. you know, not in the like, mm -hmm. hey, let's look at and see what, what God did. And, and that's what I mean by our faith should be made alive, mm -hmm. not just contained in, uh, I don't think that we should have our kids only know about God as they see in the Bible. They should see God, the God of yeah. the Bible in our everyday lives. Yeah. They should see him at work and present and the stories that he was doing in the Bible, he's still doing today in our lives. So involve our kids. And I think that happens as we share uh, in the sacrifice and the victory. And I would just add to that, we always, we always try to tell them, like, I remember just the next day afterwards, we, we pulled them all aside. We had a little family celebration dinner and we were like, you did that. Mm -hmm. you know look what you did look what you did like what did you think and and they were just talking about it and it was like they because they did you know what I mean like when God calls our family into ministry he calls the family you know what I mean and and we reminded them we're like remember all those nights you know when dad would be painting or mom would be doing this and you guys were were there and you were helping and you were part of it and like you did it guys and like at age 10 and age five they feel like they planted a church in in the heart of their city yeah. you know and it's because um it's because they they felt led through it and then they felt like they weren't just a side note like hey be quiet in the corner kids it was like be part of this kids and we even let them choose some of our kids' menu. What yes. would you like to have on the kids' menu? And they're choosing <laughs> items, so they're getting to see. You have to come down and have teddy bear toast, teddy which bear toast. is a, a brioche bread with almond butter and has the face of an adorable teddy bear made out of bananas and berries. Bananas and berries. So, <laughs> yeah. So involve, involve our families, involve our kids in the process. Let them be part of the sacrifice and the victory. Um, this next thing, I think we all understand this, but what does it actually look like? Mm -hmm. We know, you know, that our family should be priority, but I think it goes a step beyond that, which is demonstrate the priority. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that we have to be honest as ministers. Um, I don't, and I don't even know if I love the word priority or I don't like the hierarchy of priority because I believe that God create god is equipped god's in everything we we i know it's normal to say hey we put god as a priority here and family and ministry but i really think god is just in in all that we do god is when we're working god is with when we're with our kids he's not just a priority he is in the essence of all that we're doing he's part we bring because to prioritize and say well i put god as number one sounds like when we're doing number two god's not involved in it or when we're doing number three, it's like we compartmentalize God, but God's not compartmentalized. God is involved in every area of our, of our life. So I think the challenge for us then is I think sometimes it becomes a really gray area to determine when we're talking about ministry, okay, is ministry a vocation or is it God? Mm -hmm. And so then, and, and here's what it is, is I think sometimes, there are moments that we all know that it's a, a thus saith the Lord type thing where it's like, hey, you know, when, when it's a directive that God has spoken to us, that we're to do X, Y, or Z. But very often, it's just kind of the flow of life in ministry that, hey, we're, we're running our church or ministry and we're involved with people's lives. And I think that we get into dangerous territory if we start equating every need a person in our orbit has to being God. Does that make sense? To being able to say like, oh, well, this person has this need, so I have to respond to that because God's most important in my life while my kids are being neglected. Does that make sense? And maybe neglect is a strong word, but the point is it doesn't take very many needs to respond to like if, if there was just seven people a week that had a need and in the evening, then we're not home seven nights a week. Does that make sense? Like it doesn't require too much of a demand on us in our own ministry life before we're not present at home with our family. And so I think first off, we need to make a distinction between what are the things that are for sure like 
maybe God speaking to us of like, hey, like in our case, we knew that there was some extra time in launching uh, this last project that wasn't going to be sustainable and wasn't a normal, but there was going to be some evenings where dad was painting and then we were making up for it on the weekends and other things like there's a there's a flow to it. Um, but it's not sustainable. We can't say every time that somebody in our church has needs to talk or has an issue that then I have to say, well, hey, kids, God's my priority, so I'm not going to be with you. Does that make sense? We can't equate every need that's in our orbit to being some to putting the label of God on that. Uh, part of it is a leadership uh, challenge where we need to raise up other people. We need to create systems in our lives where we're not managing by chaos uh, or managing by like putting out fires. So uh, one, of the, one of the ways we do that as we, and when I say demonstrate priority, let me give you a few examples. Demonstrate priority is to not just tell our family that they're a priority, but sometimes it means showing them and pointing it out. Because sometimes like we do a bad job as parents of communicating. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we might know we're doing this as a priority, but they're not cognizant of it. You know, they're just hanging out with mom and dad. So when, whenever, because here's, here's what I'd say. Anytime that we're choosing the decision of being involved in a ministry function or doing ministry and, and the kids didn't get to see us that night or something like that, they're mindful that at least in their mind that night, we were doing ministry, not being with them. Case in point, today, two o'clock in the afternoon, uh, our kids are with a babysitter right now while we're talking to you. They know that we're coming to speak to you, right? So they're mindful of that. So I think we also have to make sure that when we're with our family and we're choosing uh, to be with family and maybe we're saying, because sometimes it is the thought of, sometimes we have to say yes or no to one or the other. And I think the thought is knowing that when we say yes to something, we're saying no to the other very often is true. And sometimes I, in my own life, I've just established some boundaries where, you know what, at the end of the day, I have to be mindful. The people that I first have to minister to is my family. And one of the things that we have to be okay with in ministry is uh, disappointing other people. That because I can, I'm not called to not disappoint people. I'm called to lead people. I'm called to love people. I am not responsible for people's disappointment. Because if, if my calling is subject to other people's disappointment, then I'm not led by obedience. I'm led by fear of disappointing other people. And we even see that in the life of Jesus and that everybody was like, let's, this guy's awesome. Let's make him the king. He's going to save, you know what I mean? Save our people. And they didn't realize that the call upon his life was to save our souls, our, the humanity, you know, it wasn't to be the next king. And so he disappointed a lot of people in his ministry and a lot of people were angry about it and had a lot to say about it. And we see that as we read scripture. Yeah. And I think that, um, what, you know, for just as an example for us, what does it look like to demonstrate priority? Sometimes it's like saying no. So, so when right now they know that we're speaking to you all, then we make sure that they know when we're saying no to a ministry thing or, hey, so-and-so really is asking for us to do X, Y, and Z. But right now we told them we can't because you've got this thing going on. We let them know that. We communicate it to them. Uh, latest example, I would say, and I'm not like saying this for all of you to go and do, uh, we're a younger church plant and this makes sense within our context. We had Father's Day this past weekend. And for, so what we did is we told everyone in our church, hey, take the weekend to be with your family and celebrate the fathers in your life. We're going to do the same thing. And we went to the lake and we spent the weekend with our kids making Father's Day memories because we wanted to demonstrate yeah that, hey, you matter, you are important. And we made memories that they're never going to forget. I played on the lake all weekend long. And same for all the other- And all the other families, church. right. Yeah. So, so I think the, the thought behind demonstrating priority is not just prioritizing, but communicating that priority that sometimes maybe it's on, maybe we need to look ahead on our calendar and we need to make sure that our kids' birthdays are yeah. circled and we're not planning ministry events around it. Mm -hmm. That, you know, that we are, 
putting priority of the people that we are most entrusted with to lead. Mm -hmm. um, and then we'll wrap with a, a, another uh, thought here mm -hmm. and then uh, open it up for any discussion or Q&A that anyone might have. Um, let's see. Oh, and the scripture that I was going to read with that real quick, 1 Timothy 5.8, it says, but if anyone does not provide for his own family, especially for his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse, is worse than an unbeliever. So just that thought that ministry, part of ministry extends to our family. They're who we should be ministering to also. Um, and within that, um, I would kind of already talked about establishing boundaries or saying like, recognize that sometimes we just have to say say no so that was another thing i was gonna say but let's just move on to the next um which is create recurring events and traditions in your family there's something about rhythms and traditions that i think are grounding and crucial to creating culture in our family um, and I think Krista is really good about doing that. Uh, it's, a, it's a value that we have as a, as a family is to create anchors and rhythms. So I think one of the most recent ones, and this is maybe I'm practical and that's maybe just kind of our style too, <laughs> but you know, when, when the lockdown happened, and that's a long time for all of us, I'm sure. I mean, like we were pretty quarantined here. We did pretty much a straight, like, six to eight weeks like just well, we locked down our, we didn't even drive anywhere yeah we we stayed uh locked down and for our kids too you know that's a long time to um to not be with friends etc and so krista wanted to create some you know silver lining in the midst of a what could be viewed as a cloudy reality uh, if you're you know, five and a ten year old and she created every night we had an ice cream party <laughs> and it was like it was, small. It was like an ice cream party but yeah but that's what we called yeah. it we called it an ice cream party and it was like okay every night at before bed seven o'clock grab your popsicle or whatever we're all gonna go out to the porch and we're gonna have our ice cream party and man if it was like it took about like three or four days of training the ice cream party and it was like a staple in our family like I every night they don't wanna, they don't yeah they don't want to we did that <laughs> for coronavirus normal. and i think they want to latch onto that for, for life they're yeah. very cognizant of their ice cream parties now but what no, would you say about I just, this culture i think it's just like rhythms. creating these beautiful moments that like i knew i knew that at the end of the whole experience of, of of lockdown they would look back on it and however we responded to it they would then take that as as the a marker in their in their spirits and their souls of how they need to respond in times of stress they would take a uh, when they'd be talking about it with maybe their grandkids, I'd love for them to have a thing and be like, you know, it was, it was bad, but I remember we had an ice cream party, you know, every single, every single night. So that part was kind of cool. And I, I wanted them to have just uh, something that kind of threaded it all through at the end of the day, we're a family, this is where you want to be. You want to come back on, um, you know, maybe it's the back porch, this little marker in their mind of like, when times are tough, we're here for you. This is like what we're all about, you know? And I think it's one way we can also do the previous thought, which was demonstrate priority for us Thursday nights. And so this, based on the season, this night has changed. Sometimes yeah. it's been Saturdays, sometimes it's been Fridays. Right now in our current season, it's Thursday night, uh, family date night. And what that looks like is uh, one week, it would be Krista and Lucy, they are having a mom-daughter date, and me and my son are having a man date, as we call it. And then the next Thursday, we switch, and it's me and my daughter, Lucy, and uh, Krista and Zion. And then the next week, it's the kids have a date night together where they go watch a movie together, and they make snacks or whatever. And Krista and I will, uh, you know, we'll either go out somewhere or do something at the house. But we, we just rotate through it. And also, like, even for, uh, for us personally, uh, we used to do a thing for years, um, and that's why I say, like, beef, it, um, it, it's fluid in the seasons that you're in, but we used to do a thing that was called, uh, every Saturday, we called it our Saturday, and that was a time that we just kind of put on the calendar, and everybody knew you don't invite Greg and Krista to anything on Saturday, because that's like their day where they're spending time, they're hanging out, 
Uh, that shifts when you start having kids. It starts looking differently, uh, different seasons that you're in. But the point is create rhythms in your life where there's anchors to making your family a priority. And the, the last thought uh, that I just hit on was, in the midst of all of that, allow for flexibility. Um, I just don't think life is as, we're not robots. And as much as we wish we could put it on autopilot and just like key it in and just never have to you know, make a conscious decision again, I just don't think that's real. Uh, life hands us things that we had no idea it would be handing us, you know, like lockdowns. And, uh, and I think that if, if we paint ourselves into a corner, like, okay, I always do this, or I never do that. I think that sometimes that sets us up to fail, like, if, especially in ministry, when we're always wanting to help people. I think that we need to be a little bit fluid with the things that God has given to us. You know, it's, I love, uh, a minister friend of mine talks about the concept of balance and how balance isn't really like he says, you know, think about standing on one foot. It's kind of tricky to stand on one foot very long. You would call that balancing. It's much easier to walk and walk goes left, right, left, right. There's a little bit of a sway. There's a little bit of a rhythm. And so the thing that we would kind of leave you with in the midst of all of this is you set your culture, you set your values, um, create a level of flexibility and grace for yourselves as well. Uh, one thing that we do, at least on an annual basis, uh, depending on how much change is going on in our year, it might be multiple times a year, where we just look and we look at our calendar and we say, what's working, what's not working, how do we, uh, what needs to shift, what needs to change, and we make those adjustments and we move forward we did it when it was on lockdown because we said we don't want our kids to just be you know they're not in school and they're online school and they're taking like an hour and a half so what do we want them to be doing what do we want their time to be filled with so I, I would just say that know that our job as uh, ministers as leaders um, is to be uh, proactive in leading our families in creating a culture, in walking them through, uh, through a lifestyle of ministry. We can do it without communicating and without leading. And I think that causes our families to be kind of separated from ministry, or we can invite them in the process and lead them through the journey. And I think one of the things that uh, was spoken to us early on and uh, is very much uh, proven it's ministered to us and proven to be true and I'd, I'd pass it on to you which is recognizing that when god is calling you to do something it's not at the expense of your family like he's good to you and to them he's not like forgetting about that you have a family if he's given you a family he's, he's giving you relationships that you're to steward he's not forgetting about that he sees that that's also your uh, calling in this season and in this life. And so he doesn't call us to do things that, that forces us to abandon them. That what's good. So we had, to, we had to wrestle that when we moved to Ecuador. It was like, oh man, what's that look like for our kid to be raised in another country? And what it looks like is it became his home country and he loved it. And he absolutely misses living in Ecuador, you know? So just know that like, the center of his will for your family is at the same place that the center of his will is for your life. Like he's not confused. The best for our kids is in the midst of the place of obedience in our own lives. So that being said, um, we, a little something flying around, um, happy to open it up to any comments, questions, etc. cetera. Um, thank you all for, for joining in. If you need to go ahead and, uh, exit, feel free, but if you have any comments or questions that you would like to uh, throw out there, we'd be happy to, to discuss with you as well. And just remember to, if you, if you do want to say something, just uh, you'll have to unmute your uh, mic there. Can you hear me? This is Carl Kettenen. Yes, how you doing, Carl? Good. Um, I just really, I missed like the first 10 minutes or so of the 
of the message of 10 or 15 minutes because I was trying to connect from my phone. And so I, I missed some of it, but I really just loved the whole thing. Um, I'm going to share this with my wife and ask her to watch it too. Um, what I was actually hoping to do um, is to try to connect with you guys offline if that's possible. I promise sure. it won't be on a Thursday or whatever day. <laughs> um, there's just some things about that you shared that are just, um, there's some similarities to the things that God's put on my heart um, for ministry. And so I was just hoping that I might be able to try to connect with you guys um, offline just so I can talk and not take up lots of people's times and not a lot of your time. Just wanted to connect with you because I feel like there are some similarities to the things that you are doing and to what God's called me and me to do. Yeah, totally. Well, and anybody's welcome to reach out to us. A good email address for us is uh, you can email me and that'll email both of us. Uh, it's G Baca, it's G B A C A. So G Baca at go international dot TV. Okay. She'll write it. Go international dot TV. Okay. I'm just going to put it in the G -baca chat. at go international dot TV. Yeah. So yeah, feel free. Okay, to great. Okay, great. No, that's great. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Anyone else? Any other uh, comments, questions? No pressure. Just leaving the opportunity. <laughs> I, I have one. Do you guys have any good book recommendations for um, cultivating family life? Hmm. <laughs> I mean, I'm trying to think of the last parenting book. We read a lot of, a lot of books. Maybe, <laughs> maybe books. Um, not that comes to mind. Um, I think that I, I think that our our approach to our kids has very much been what Krista was talking I, I think that traveling internationally has shown so much the what we were talking about about like what's normal one of the things that I that I think we picked up on very early is that whatever normal we want for our kids creates that normal from the beginning so we were very like maybe eccentric or even seemingly odd like when our kids were tiny, we would communicate everything. We would say like, yeah, like from the time they were just born, we would say, hey, like, come here, daddy's going to hold you. We're going to change your diaper, like whatever, anything we were actually doing, we were verbally saying. And then like, and what was crazy about it, they, they picked up language very early, both of them very early talkers. First night we took them home from the hospital. Um, we for us, we wanted family dinner to be a thing that we do. So we thought, well, if we, if we start at family dinner every night, they'll never know a time when there wasn't family dinner. We won't have to try and get them to sit in their seat when they turn three years old and untrain them something. We'll just train them from the beginning. So the day we bring them home from the hospital, they're in their little carrier and we sit them on the table and we have family dinner and, they bo and eating out. We like to eat at restaurants. So we said, okay, that's what we do. So we're going to bring them with us. And I say that, I know you're asking about a book, but I, I think that's a little bit indicative of our philosophy is that I'm just a big believer in first and foremost, and the thought that what normals we want for our children, I think that, and it's not to say we can't have other voices. We do need to have other voices, but I do think there's something on the inside of us. I think it's the leading of the Holy Spirit that knows exactly what's right for our kids um, and our families of the normal that, and I'd say normal, like what, what's the reality is maybe a different word. What's the reality that we would have them to experience and begin creating that from day one. And so I, I guess I say that to say like for us, that's our guiding principle or philosophy and maybe especially going overseas uh, I did have to read a lot of the 
Strong Willed Children yes. books by James Dobson once my Luciana was born. Yes, Luciana, <laughs> five going on. She, she was born with an opinion. Yep. <laughs> so the, the, those are some of the books that we read more in terms of yeah. individual children. But in terms of culture and lifestyle, mm -hmm. maybe you need to write a book. Maybe you do. <laughs> yeah. That sounds good. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. I just want to commend you. Thank you for this question. And um, it's Mary Linda Rizzo. This is But I really like that you said the norm is what I created to be. That is too cool. Because you've always compared yourself. But you're kind of Could coming you a little it? bit in and out. Maybe get a little closer to the microphone. Okay. I'll give you a thumbs up when we can hear you good. Better? It's a little better, but it sounds real quiet. Okay. Maybe, I don't know if yours. I, I think that's okay. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to thank you for this session and to let you know that I like when you said that normal is what I created to be. Because a lot of times you're comparing what your normal is to someone else's normal. And I never thought about creating my own normal. So I really appreciate that. And to say how amazing it is that your children are already involved in ministry. And, mm -hmm. um, and so I just, I just appreciate your session. And I just wanted to commend you for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I think we... We're going to be doing two other sessions. Krista's got a session tomorrow, and I've got one on Thursday. And we're actually going to be expanding a little uh, bit more on the concept of creating normal, mm -hmm. like outside of just family, but like uh, really the topic of creativity. Yeah. And what does that look like to create uh, normal? And how do you do that? How do you actually start with blank canvas and begin to create uh, the life that God has called us to live. So definitely. And I would say to answer the previous, previous question a little bit more, uh, the model that we're, we're really honing in on with the kids is in the, is the first few chapters of Genesis. We're really passionate about that, that model, if you read it, and even go into, if you're, if you're in a church, go teach it to your kids ministry, teach creation to your kids ministry and listen to what they're asking you about creating, because you'll learn so much. I love doing kids ministry; it's like one of my passions, but those first few chapters is really the model of how to create anything. And so we'll be talking about that a little bit more mm -hmm. in the next couple sessions. It'll be good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Thoughts, comments, questions? Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, well, I've already raised my family, so, but, but what I really appreciate what you've been saying and sharing because it helps me to, when I look back, I can see the successes that I've had and I can see where we missed it. You know, so I have some things now that I can share. Mm -hmm. uh, with other people and I appreciate that thank you yeah that's awesome mm -hmm. that's thank so you awesome. anybody else well thank you all for uh, joining today um, we as we said we'll have a few more sessions later this week so hopefully we'll get a chance to be in another session with you. And if not, um, then thanks for your time today. And let's just uh, end in prayer really quick. Lord, we thank you. We love you. We thank you for your goodness. I thank you for each one that was able to join in the conversation today. Father, we thank you that, uh, that you have graced us and equipped us to do all that you've entrusted us with, Lord. We just thank you that, uh, that we can make an impact in this world we can be obedient to you and we can minister to others and our families simultaneously lord that what that you have given us all that we need to uh to to walk out that which you've called us to do so we thank you for it thank you for creative ideas for wisdom lord uh for understanding of proper balance and priorities lord 
And we just thank you that all of us would be able to live out successfully. What does it look like to have healthy ministry and healthy family? In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, God bless you all and uh, hope that our paths will cross in the future. Carl, we look forward to uh, receiving an email from you and uh, you all have a great day.